Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, in our latest event in this in this series, uh, Emerging Voices in Race, Russian, East European Eurasian Studies at the Macmillan Center at Yale. Uh, and I'm, uh, my name is Marieta Bozhevich. I'm an assistant professor at Yale in Slavic languages and literatures, uh, affiliated also with film and media and women's gender and sexuality studies. And I'm really delighted to be part of the organizing team for this series, uh, which includes our fearless re leader, Doug Rogers, also my co-conspirators, Jin Yu Chu, Mina Magda, uh, Spencer Small, and increasingly Claire Rusian, who will be joining us as a discussant for today's event. Um, uh, this series has really been one of the highlights of this academic year. Is something sparked by the pandemic year, but I hope not exclusive to it, and that we'll, we can continue to keep going in some format, hybrid or otherwise, in the coming years. Um, so today, I am especially thrilled to welcome our speaker, Zuhra Kasimova, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, she is finishing a dissertation tentatively titled Uzbek, Karakalpak, and Soviet, Multinational in Form, Hybrid in Content, uh, with dates given of 1941 to 1981. Uh, an author of the recent publication in Ab Imperio, this is in 2019, um, of an article titled The Improbable Museum, Igor Savitsky's Art Museum in Nukus as an Artifact of Post-War Soviet Reality. And it is on this topic and on her research on the Nukus Museum that Zuhra is going to be joining us and speaking today. So join me in welcoming her and thanking her for participating in this series. Zohra, please take, take the stage. Thank you very much for this introduction, Marietta. And uh, thank you for, for the entire team um, and these amazing series that you put together. So um, my screen sharing is paused. It says, can you see my screen right now or no? Uh, that's great that you can. Uh, if at some point it stops sharing, please let me know because for some reason still, it still says that screen sharing is paused. <laughs> I don't know why. So um, today I'm gonna talk about um, Igor Savitsky's collection of Russian avant-garde, modernist paintings, uh, as well as Karakalpak art, um, that was created in Nukus, Karakal, Pakistan um, in 1966. So um, briefly, what I think the main contribution of this research is and what I hope to accomplish. Um, so why I call it Improbable Museum for one is because um, it was sort of a grassroots uh, campaign to create this museum because in the Soviet times it's difficult to imagine that museums are um, created by popular initiative from below. Usually they are organized by decree, um, by the Soviet decree from you know national republics or whatnot. So it's not usually just individuals who come up with an idea of the museum and that museum ends up being created and gets state funding. So in that um, in this context, this is, in fact, a very improbable museum, which um, is very unique, um, not only in Central Asia or Karakal, Pakistan, but across, I would argue, the Soviet geography. There are other examples of uh, grassroots movements to create art museums of small nations. I would argue Karakal, Pakistan are kind of smaller ethnic group which uh, was part of the Uzbek Republic and still remains part of the Uzbek Republic even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, there were other examples um, from individuals. For example, there was one in Moldova by a small indigenous community, ethnic Turkic community called Gagaus. Erin uh, Hutchison is a researcher who writes about them. But as she shows, as Erin shows, these smaller museums were usually not very successful. So hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate how this one was different and how it was possible to create such a large collection um, and maintain it throughout the Soviet Union and, and even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
So um, another thing that I hope to show through the example of this museum is the central periphery relations. Um, the relations between not just Moscow and Karakalpak Autonomous Republic, but to complicate this relationship by showing how Karakalpaks negotiated uh, with Uzbeks as well, because Karakalpak Republic was part of the Uzbek national one. So the financial and administrative relationships are complicated by that fact that it's not just Moscow and the smaller nation um, in there, but there are uh, various actors involved at various levels. Um, also, I hope to demonstrate how the figure of Igor Savitsky, who himself was originally um, a painter, but then turned into this uh, person who created museum, run it, became its official director, how Savitsky uh, basically acted as sort of a trickster, to borrow a term from Mark Lipovetsky, uh, a trickster in the sense that he was uh, manipulating these gray zones uh, of this um, hybrid Soviet space. Uh, and he was able to negotiate certain terms for the museum um, by talking to people in Moscow, by talking to people in Tashkent, in the capital of the Uzbek Republic, and to local intelligentsia in Karakal, Pakistan. So I'm trying to show that Savitsky, of course, was not the only person who uh, made this museum possible. The local Karakalpak elites were the ones he co-opted. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think my project um, echoes, for example, um, the arguments of Professor Adib Khalid, who wrote about how Uzbeks were the ones participating in creating Uzbek Republic, not only Bolsheviks from the center, but Uzbeks on the ground. And in that sense, we also see how Karakalpaks, for example, had their own project that was co-opted by Savitsky in a sense. So this is a very uh, multi-level hybrid enterprise, which was envisioned differently from Moscow or from Nukus or from Tashkent. So uh, let's try um, to focus a little bit on the persona of Savitsky. Um, so this is a small excerpt from the letter that he wrote um, to one of his colleagues in Moscow. Uh, and I quote, he says, I understand that the problems of Nuku scare people away for everyone considers it a hole in the wall, a place in the middle of nowhere. However, it is not so because for one, only in Nukus was it possible to create such an improbable museum, the one impossible to build elsewhere. So here Savitsky, of course, um, talks about the difficulties, technical, financial difficulties of bringing the artifacts from various parts of the Soviet Union to uh, Nukus and Karakal, Pakistan, which is actually uh, located between, um, I'll skip over to show you the map. So this is where the Karakalpak Republic is located, right next to the Aral Sea. So it's literally between two deserts, between Kizilkum and Karakum. And also, uh, what you can see here on the map is that Karakal, Pakistan is located between several of Central Asian republics. So we have Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan here. Um, so that makes Karakalpaks um, that created a problem historically for Karakalpaks trying to envision themselves as a separate ethnic category. Because when the Soviets uh, started creating these uh, national republics in Central Asia, they considered according to the uh, Stalin's um, paradigm of what nation entailed, five different aspects of belonging to a nation, its culture, its separate culture, separate language, uh, way of life, economy and territory. So Karakalpak seemed to have possessed most of these uh, traits, right? Except for the culture, because arguably, as a lot of Soviet ethnographers in 1920s said, Karakalpaks are small nomadic population, which is very similar to neighboring Turkmenes and Kazakhs. So they're not really um, a separately identifiable ethnical group. So that is one of the reasons why Karakalpaks ended up being just an autonomous republic attached to Uzbek one, and they had never been granted a full, um, full independence in a sense. Um, so what happens when Savitsky uh, first ends up in the Central Asia, it was during the 
evacuation to Central Asia from Moscow during the World War II. Savitsky is still a student in the art school. And that's when he realizes um, that these various ethnic groups are so different from one another. He becomes, after the war, he joins the, he, he decides to stay in the region uh, because he's so fascinated with, uh, with arts and culture and people. He decides to stay and he accepts the invitation of Sergei Tolstov, who was uh, head of the, one of the largest uh, Soviet ethnographic archeological expeditions um, called Horizmian Expedition. It's also in the region, uh, in the Karakal, Pakistan. So Savitsky stays in the region. And so he starts collecting, um, he starts collecting the um, applied arts of local Karakal box. It's late 19th century, mostly late 19th century. Oops, it stopped sharing, right? That's just interesting how, um, I need a second here. I don't know I what think happened. I think there was an issue with the, the slides, if you could try resharing. Yeah, I'm trying to, I think just the, the whole thing just shut down somehow. Can you see it now? Let's see. So maybe it's an opportunity for me to um, try to, um, talk a little bit about the collection itself. So even though Savitsky started by collecting the um, ethnographic part of the collection, the Karkalpak art, um, of course, the museum nowadays is mostly known for its avant-garde Russian slash Soviet slash Turkestani avant-garde mo modernist paintings. So um, basically Savitsky's collection is comprised of several uh, parts which are arguably very, very different. And it's difficult to imagine how they do comprise the one single um, collection. So the, I'll show you several of those modernist avant-garde Russian paintings, which um, usually always are demonstrated when uh, the museum uh, travels with part of its collection. This is one of its most famous paintings uh, by Evgeny Lysenko. So uh, what Svitsky did, he basically collected some of these paintings because avant-garde and modernist paintings um, during Stalin's era and afterwards were banned from being exhibited and purchased by state museums. Basically, Svitsky saved these paintings from obscurity, from being just thrown away. Um, because nobody would be allowed to buy them, no state enterprise would. And so Savitsky was able to do that. So these are just some of them. These are examples from uh, the one on the right is by Usto Mumin. Uh, he's one of the representatives of the Turkistani avant-garde, what it's called now. Um, this is by local Uzbek uh, painter, Ural Tansikbaev. Um, so Tansik Bay, for example, was famous for um, painting in a very conformist um, Soviet realist style, but Savitsky was able to convince Tansik Bay to bring the, to give away the part of, of his paintings, which was in, in this kind of modernist style, which Tansik Bay never showed or exhibited before. So these are the works that are most famous now and Savitsky's collection is usually within the last couple of decades, I think after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became very popular. There were a couple of movies, documentary movies made about the collection. There were a number of um, articles that came up in, uh, in Western mostly press that kind of popularized um, the collection. So everybody started calling it the second largest collection of avant-garde, Russian avant-garde in the world. And I think even there were charter planes uh, in late nineties uh, going directly from New York to New Kuz to just see the collection. So, um, and I argue that this is a poster from one of these movies, which of course always talks about the uh, focuses on the avant-garde collection of the museum and they kind of present Savitsky as a person who, um, who single-handedly um, kind of tried to oppose the Soviet ban on avant-garde, how he was savior for these paintings. Um, but I think uh, what remains 
kind of forgotten here is that Svitsky, of course, was not alone. There were local Karakalpak um, intelligentsia members as well as people who worked in the Karakalpak um, Communist Party, who were the ones who helped Savitsky to make this museum official, to get funding for it. Just imagine in, in the Soviet um, hierarchy of Soviet national republics, the autonomous republic like Karakalpaks would get very, very limited funding, not only for arts, but for anything at all, for urban planning, for transportation, for anything really. And imagining that Savitsky was able to buy hundreds and thousands of um, art items every year, it's, it's just, you know, mind blowing. So Savitsky, of course, was able to accomplish this because he co-opted that national projects that Karakalpax had in mind. When I talk about national project, of course, um, I talk about Karakalpax um, idea of imagining themselves as a full-fledged Soviet nation in a sense. Um, so, so when Savitsky came up with this idea of having a museum of Karakalpak art, um, local intelligentsia was very happy and you know, they embraced the idea. And that's how basically Savitsky got the museum. Because of course, if, he, if Savitsky would have just said, well, I'm gonna collect avant-garde paintings, nobody would have allowed that to happen, right? So this is an interesting moment of creation of the museum in 1966, when um, this museum has multiple cores. Uh, so like it has avant-garde, it has local Karakalpak applied arts, and plus it has um, the art of modern Karakalpak painting and sculpture. Um, Savitsky was able to open like workshops on the premises of the museum. So another part of this whole enterprise for Savitsky was to basically, um, basically to um, teach young generation of Karakalpaks to be modern, to be Soviet, to be, um, you know, to be national in a very Soviet sense of the world. So this is um, Marat Nurmuhamedov. He, he was one of the local Karakalpak intelligentsia members who wholeheartedly embraced Savitsky's project. He was the first uh, Karakalpak um, member of the local Academy of Sciences. Around the same time in 1950s, the local Academy of Sciences for Karakalpax opened up. Before that, they only could be members of the Uzbek one and Uzbek one opened only in 1940s. So this is a moment when these national projects and national academic enterprises are being embraced uh, in the post-war era. So Nur Muhammadov, of course, was a mastermind behind you know, all these um, administrative paperwork that Savitsky had to file, to ask for funding, to get approval, to acquire those paintings. Um, because obviously Savitsky was such a, you know, very simple, naive person who would have never been able to uh, figure things out, how to speak, you know, Soviet speak, so to say, you know, in a sense of like speaking the bureaucratic language. So Nur Muhammadov was the one who would, um, you know, comment on the drafts that Savitsky would write to uh, to the Communist Party, to the Ministry of Culture. So they basically worked in tandem, in a sense. So um, this is just some pictures of Savitsky in um, in the Kuz and around the desert. So you could imagine what kind of uh, you know environment he was in. Um, so this is Savitsky with uh, the piece of the Karakalpa jewelry. And uh, he published uh, and he researched the local Karakalpa uh, artifacts, proving that Karakalpa art was very, very distinct from local Turkmens and Kazakhs. These are also some uh, items from the Karakalpa collection at the museum. Um, So another reason why I would argue that the avant-garde part of the collection was not the most important one for Savitsky is that in 1970s, in, you know, in 1975 and onwards, just 10 years after the creation of the museum, um, the economic situation 
in the Soviet Union started getting worse. So basically, um, it was very difficult to sustain uh, the collection to keep acquiring new artifacts. And plus, Savitsky wanted to expand the, the building or to get a new building to house the entire collection. Um, and in the economic conditions in mid 19th, 1970s and on, onwards in Soviet Union, it became practically impossible. And there was also the moment when Moscow started demanding um, many national republics to give away one of the most important artifacts they had in, in their local collections, be it art museum or you know some general museums in the area. So um, that is when Savitsky writes a letter these are local Karakal box. We're basically looking at um, at the art produced by by their um, community. So, what Savitsky does in, in a uh, desperate bid to keep the collection intact, um, he writes a letter to Brezhnev uh, and says, "This collection cannot be divided." I am not able to give away neither the, the local Karakalpak artifacts nor the ancient Charismian artifacts that were part of that Charismian expedition dig, which he was a member of in 1950s, neither other paintings. I just cannot imagine, this collection cannot be imagined um, separately. Um, so this is one of the reasons why I believe um, the collection originally was imagined by Savitsky as a complex wholeness of this very different parts of the collection. Even though seemingly it seems uh, impossible to imagine how uh, Russian modernist paintings and 19th century Karakalpak applied arts like harnesses, jewelry um, could be imagined as part of the same collection. So, um, so basically what happens, um, I wanted to just step back a little and I think I missed the part about how the museum actually was created in the Soviet bureaucratic situation. So what happened is uh, because Karakalpaks were, um, were autonomous republic and the Uzbek National Republic, um, the, the funds, uh, the money has to come from Uzbeks and Uzbeks would get it from, from Moscow. So there were um, annual budgets that would be set for each national republic. And then the national republic, in this case, Uzbeks, they would um, provide certain amount of that money to a smaller regions. But that's not the case how the museum was created. Uh, this is a copy of the letter that uh, Savitsky sent um, after local Karakalpak administration already decided to create the museum and they officially had an opening and the museum was operating for a couple months already. Um, so basically Karakalpaks already by opening up this museum, they overstepped uh, their administrative um, limits. They were not supposed to decide something like this opening of a state art museum without the go ahead or approval from Tashkent, from Uzbeks. However, they did this and like after the fact, after the museum had already been created, uh, Savitsky is writing a letter uh, to the head of the Uzbek Communist Party at the time, Sharaf Rashidov, saying that we already created the museum. Um, he's basically trying to legitimize the creation of the museum post factum after it already happened. Um, and then he says he lists three main um, parts of this collection, saying that it's uh, going to be the collection of uh, Karakalpak light art, of um, ancient Charismian artifacts, and uh, those who read Russian can see it. Here it says uh, Izobrazitelne Iskusta, which is just, uh, you know, paintings. So that's how basically Savitsky hides that uh, modernist avant-garde paintings in, in the plain sight. He does not really explain what he means by paintings. So he does a really kind of strategic move here because of course in, in, in the context of the Soviet, you know, nation building and, you know, affirming these developing um, smaller nations, it is important to 
you know, it's politically correct to say I'm going to be focusing on ethnic Karakalpak art, on some ancient artifacts of the region. So he puts all these things uh, under number one and number two, and then he just vaguely says paintings. Um, under the last third category. So that is how I argue Savitsky was actually able to um, collect these uh, then banned avant-garde paintings because nobody really knew that they were banned, that he was gonna collect those paintings that were banned. Um, at that time in 1966, when Savitsky created this museum in the coast, nobody was really able to officially acquire paintings by these same uh, artists that Savitsky was getting to for Moscow or Leningrad museums, for example. I think only in 1970, such artists as Falk is, um, started slowly um, being, their work started being demonstrated in, in the central art museums. So basically it was to Savitsky's advantage that he decided to create this museum in, in how he himself called it, um, in, in, in the periphery, because nobody really could realize what was going on. And it was so far from Moscow's site that it was such a remote, geographically remote area that they did not get those, um, you know, uh, people from Moscow all that often, people who would be able to spot what was really going on. So in a sense, it works to Savitsky's advantage, but of course, uh, the flip side of it was that the collection would not be, would not be seen by too many people. So um, I think I'll stop here so that we have enough time for um, Q&A and for comments. Is it fine? Of course. Um, thank you so much for that fabulous and really intriguing talk. Uh, I think I might start us off because I think that Claire Rusan, who will be the discussant, is joining us right at 3.30, coming in from mm -hmm. a class. Um, uh, so I'll say a few words introducing her when she does join. Uh, and I'll start off with a, with a question of my own. Um, I was thinking a lot about museum formation, uh, my own thoughts and assumptions about museum formation. And thinking about the, the museum project um, associated with 19th century Victorian culture, right? The project which is um, collecting, preserving, and interpreting objects that are deemed to be of significance, cultural, maybe scientific um, uh, significance um, for the benefit of the public and specifically for the education of the public. Um, that the museum project always kind of contains this paradox of um, it has a, a, a democratic aim, a democratizing aim, um, but it is tightly controlled by um, a, a leading elite. Um, and by the way, you know, we see, of course, the, the after effects of that paradox in the perpetual ongoing calls to create a more democratic museum, a real democratic museum, the democratic museum of the future, etc. But anyway, this kind of this focus on museum and democracy and contradictions of museum and democracy. Um, uh, this project uh, seems to have uh, a very different kind of relationship in mind with the public. So I guess my question to you is thinking more broadly about the museum uh, as its own cultural form. Um, what is the relationship imagined to the public? What's, the, what's different about a Soviet museum to begin with? And then what is different about Savitsky's collection from the Soviet Museum? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marietta. This is a really great question. So um, I'll probably start answering by, um, by defining what usually um, a regular museum at the Soviet Union would entail. So um, starting with 1920s, when these um, art museums and ethnographic museums started um, being created across the Soviet Union, um, they would be strictly divided into certain categories. So for example, art museum would only serve certain purpose and the ethnographic museum would basically was supposed to show the evolution of certain ethnic group or groups uh, to the full-fledged nation in the Soviet kind of, you know, Marxist-Leninist concept of uh, national development. Uh, but Savitsky Museum was already different in that sense because it had both the ancient Charismian artifact collection that showed the 
culture, arts and culture of the ancient Charismia. And of course, that complicated the whole uh, analysis of the Central Asian region because Charismians uh, of that ancient times were of course not Muslims, not Christians, they were Zoroastrians. And that kind of shows how different that region was. Um, but so in a sense, Savitsky's museum does have some elements of the ethnographic uh, museum in itself, even though it's dubbed as an art museum. But, um, but the issue is, despite the fact that Savitsky did work at that archaeologic ethnographic uh, expedition, um, Charismian one under under the management of Sergei uh, Tolstov, and Tolstov was, of course, um, the student of uh, Mar, who was a famous ethnographer, very Marxist-minded ethnographer, who would always follow this uh, meticulously follow the logic of national development. Um, Savitsky was just uh, an artist in that exhibition who would just make you know some pictures of uh, of the findings. But he of course knew how the ethnographic work is usually done. So one would think Savitsky would use that knowledge to label the artifacts he displays as part of his museum, right? That he would have some kind of like scientific or semi-scientific explanation for, for those ancient artifacts and whatnot that he was exhibiting. But no, Savitsky was known for including as little is information as he possibly could in description of, of the collection. I mean, uh, pertaining to the modernist uh, avant-garde paintings, one could understand why. Uh, with the avant-garde paintings, he would, for example, sometimes not even mention the, the authorship of, uh, of a painter. He would just say, unknown painter. Of course, later on, it was discovered that under unknown painter, it was a painter whose works, avant-garde works, were banned in the Soviet Union. That's how he basically kind of saved the collection. He protected its integrity. And he kind of retained the right to decide freely what kind of works from the collection can be exhibited on, on its walls because otherwise he would have to hide them. You know, he might be able to have them somewhere in, in, in the storage, but not actually put them as a part of the exhibit, right? But here, if he labels those paintings as authored by a known painter, then, you know, he, is, um, he has more, free, more freedom to kind of decide what he does with it. Um, so Savitsky was notorious for actually being super unscientific in how he labeled those, um, those artifacts and exhibits. So in that regard, it's very difficult to, to imagine really what was his uh, ultimate purpose um, of uh, exhibiting those. Apparently it was not the straightforward Soviet traditional purpose of educating the public in the Soviet sense, right? It seems like Savitsky was either trying to imagine the Soviet Karakalpak whatnot project as a more kind of egalitarian or what a free thinking enterprise where everybody is more or less free to determine um, things for themselves to, you know, analyze paintings or artifacts the way they wanted to. So uh, in that sense, yes, I think uh, his, um, his purpose in, in exhibiting those items was very different from, from the original Soviet one. Um, and another thing, of course, is I always thought that the idea why Savitsky wanted to fuse these things together, the Soviet avant-garde and, you know, uh, local culture was basically because we know we all know what happened to the avant-garde, right? It was banned and ultimately those schools were closed. So that line of artistic expression was basically halted in the Soviet Union. So it seems like Savitsky as a person who did have um, an artistic education, he was trying to kind of, I don't know the right word, to kind of remake this halted Soviet modernization project, but in a less totalitarian way, in a more kind of open way that people would be able to um, call their own. So it seems like Savitsky's attempt to kind of remake the Soviet modernity in a way that would not be limiting. Uh, but it's, of course, my, um, you know, um, my analysis of it, which might not be the real story, how it was in his mind. Yep. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'll maybe uh, ask one more question before passing the floor to Claire, who has joined us. Um, uh, and uh, I should say, you know, I've I've visited this collection. I've I've been to the museum um, uh, a decade or so ago now, uh, and uh, from the contemporary imagination, um, uh, the museum is I don't I want to say overshadowed by, but is in a strange environmental dialogue with the ecological catastrophe of the Aral Sea. Um, uh, and so I wonder how that, so again, for me, you know, thinking also in terms of the, the photographs that I associate with that visit, that collection, we see the, um, the graveyard of ships um, uh, in the backdrop. Um, and it's something that gets featured in the, in the documentary. So I wonder about how that also affects and influences your own framing. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a really interesting question. I was, when I was there uh, in the museum uh, last time, it was, I think, in 2018, um, I was trying just to imagine uh, Savitsky in 1950s when he first arrived there, how did the area look like back then? Because apparently when one travels to, to what is now the shore of what remains of the Aral Sea, it's quite far from where it used to be some three or four decades ago, right? So for example, now to get to, to where there's still some remaining water, you have to travel, I forgot how, how much, but I think like 130 kilometers. So it's quite far now from the city. And of course the whole infrastructure had been um, disrupted because in the Soviet times, there was a rather economically viable area in a sense that, you know, people living around, um, you know, the Kusin, the, the bigger um, centers, um, bigger cities around the Aral Sea, um, they were mostly fishermen and they were able to, you know, uh, produce, uh, you know, they would produce like, they would have factories to produce canned fish. And so there was some economic and like social activity there. And back in 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, Savitsky actually, um, had some traveling exhibitions. Um, I don't know exactly what it's called um, in English, but Russian, so in Soviet context, it was quite popular to have like, you know, traveling movie theaters or, you know, traveling museums, um, kind of, you know, visiting some smaller villages, which naturally usually don't have um, a cultural institution of their own. So Savitsky actually did want to educate more people and to show parts of the collection. So they did travel to those smaller villages across the Aral Sea. Um, so I think it's it's very different now in a sense, like um, I bet a lot of uh, museum goers, goers who visit um, Savitsky collection nowadays, um, I'm not sure they what is their um, you know, impression of the museum if they, because a lot of them, I imagine, would come there just for the museum because what else is there to do in, in the city of Nukus itself? It's a tiny little city. I remember I walked from the airport to the museum because my hotel was right next across the street. You guys probably, those who, who've been there, you probably stayed in the same little hotel because it's right across the street. I think it's called GP actually. Uh, it's not supposed to be a, you know, advertisement of the hotel, but uh, it's just, such a tiny little area, which um, kind of it's difficult to imagine how anybody who arrives there in 1950s would just say, there's going to be a museum here, world-class museum that everybody is going to be talking about. These were the ambitions of Savitsky. I read this not once, not twice in many letters that he sent to various people in Moscow, in Tashkent, to his colleagues and friends. He had these grand ambitions of a great museum that people would um, come to visit from abroad. It's, you know, I try not to psychoanalyze Savitsky too much and not to put him on a pedestal, but um, but it's just amazing how back then, you know, he, he would envision it as such a, you know, uh, a museum with such an importance. He had this vision, it seems, uh, in the place which was the least fit for a museum of, of such stature in a sense, because there was no infrastructure. There was still no infrastructure, sadly. So, um, I mean, um, I also know that uh, there was a change in the administration of the museum recently, and I'm hoping that that would open um, doors for some researchers and it's going to be more um, artistic and uh, academic back and forth between, um, you know, the museum and 
people who are eager to study it, you know, academically and whatnot. So hopefully there will be changes, um, but we yet have to see how it's going to play out. Thank you so much, Zokra. And uh, I want to now take the moment to introduce Claire, um, uh, stepping into the role of discussant, uh, my, my colleague as of next fall, um, a scholar of cultural politics in Central Asia, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union, with a real focus precisely on these areas and thinking about the complex uh, dynamics and interrelationships between the centers and peripheries of power and cultural capital. So Claire, take it away. Okay. Um, thank you, Zuhra. I, I enjoyed the opportunity to read this newer version of this talk, having already seen one version of it before. It's really cool to see the project develop. Um, so uh, my first question has to do um, with this the question of nation um, that you raise here. Um, so I understand this fits into your bigger project about um, Karakal Pakistan and Kar Kar Karakal Pak nationhood within the system of Soviet nationalities. Um, I, and I think, you know, I, I would be really interested to hear a little bit more about how this fits into that broader framework. Um, Karakal Paks uh, are um, as uh, 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 belonging to an autonomous region, but not having a full republic of their own. Um, they're in a weird liminal state between titular and non-titular nations. Um, and with all the work that's coming out now with about non-titular nations as well as titular nations, um, I wonder um, how you could describe how this, how this museum fits into that broader project of uh, Kara Kalpak nation building. Um, second, on a related note, um, you discuss how um, you suggest that Savitsky kind of tactically uses the category of the, the Karakalpak nation um, to get local administrators on his side, uh, but also as a way of negotiating with the center in Moscow. Um, so would you see Savitsky as a real sort of defender of the Karakalpak nation or a, you know, a supporter of Karakalpak nation building, or is this a more tactical use of um, the discourse of nationhood and nation building? Um, <laughs> Um, I, I'll, I have two more questions and you don't have to answer them all, um, uh, but I, I hope that we can continue the conversation as well. Um, so uh, my second question has to do with uh, this, the fact, you know, the museum, right? Um, and, and in the broader context of uh, museum studies and, you know, all the, all the work on colonial mu museums, ethnographic museums and such. Um, so you said um, near the beginning that this Savitsky's, Savitsky's museum is the opposite of a colonial ethnographic museum um, in the sense that Hirsch describes. Um, and you suggest that uh, Savitsky, Savitsky had an, a vision of Karakalpak culture as fitting in alongside avant-garde Western, Western art uh, on an equal footing. Um, there's another way, possible way of reading this though, um, uh, you know, Orientalist museums tend to do this, um, you know, to collapse art by and about the Orient, to mix up time periods, uh, to flatten cultural diversity. Um, so how would you respond uh, to people who, who would say, no, this is really a, you know, a colonial museum um, in a new form? Um, uh, you, you know, can, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, and do you think that uh, if Savitsky's museum is atypical for Soviet museums, um, do you think it can productively be compared to uh, colonial, post-colonial museums elsewhere um, outside the Soviet Union? Um, and third, I'm just really interested in the story you tell about the man, um, Savitsky, you call him a trickster. Um, uh, so you, you know, you're sort of suggesting that he's maybe an aberration from the Soviet norm, that he really is doing something different and unexpected. Um, I got to thinking though about, um, you know, thinking about Soviet men um, in the sense that Kotkin talks about Soviet men, you know, the little tactics of the habitat. It seems like Savitsky is just an expert at this. I mean, he's, he, he uses all the tactics that Soviet men had to use to get done what they wanted to get done. Um, so is there another way that his tricksterism could be um, could be represented as a kind of Sovietness, um, or do you see him as fitting uh, as as being um, separate from you know and and in a way uh, standing separately from 
from Soviet life and doing something entirely different. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. These are all great questions. May I just take them in different order? Thanks. So I'd like to address the trickster part first. Um, I mean, I mentioned in the talk that um, I get, I borrow this trickster um, definition from Mark Lipovetsky. And of course, Lipovetsky, uh, when he, in his book, um, he, he, the examples that he brings are all literary characters, right? Um, Astab Bender, for one, and many, many others that come from Russian and Soviet uh, literature, right? So, um, what is missing here, I would think, um, in describing Savitsky as a trickster and, and the perfect definition of uh, Mark Lipovetsky is basically that, uh, of course, a trickster, the original one, as you describe, is, is that sort of like very cynical Soviet person. Uh, we can also maybe bring an example of um, um, of everything was forever until it was no more sociological, um, you know, analysis of the Leningrad youth in 1970s, when the author argues that basically everybody already knew that they have to speak in perfect Soviet terms, but what they meant was totally different, right? Like people already lived in this double think and double speak in a sense. And they could just, you know, operate on these two levels. So that kind of suggests um, both trickster and uh, late Soviet thinking. Uh, it kind of suggests that people were cynical, that they perfectly understood what they were doing uh, for what ends, right? Uh, I, I did not quite get that um, uh, looking at the Savitsky story because he did come across from looking at various uh, people who actually knew him personally, who communicated with him, it does seem that he was much more naive person in a sense who did not really know at times how to actually speak in the bureaucrat bureaucratic language, excuse me. So uh, it did seem that these local Karakalpaks were the ones who were much more well-versed in this Soviet Bolshevik speak using Kotkin again, right? Um, than Savitsky was. Um, so they were the ones who basically tutored him, who fixed the, like, you know, drafts of his letters to communist uh, party bosses saying, you cannot put things this way, you have to kind of, you know, present it differently, otherwise you're going to be punished. And of course, if you look at the history of, uh, you know, family histories, personal histories of those Karakalpak intelligentsia, that would probably be true if you look extrapolated to any other local intelligentsia member at the time, most of them were children of uh, local party members and their parents were purged. So for example, the guy whose picture I showed, um, local Karakalpak uh, academician, um, Marat Nurmuhamedov, his father was a Karakalpak communist party leader in 1920s, who was of course, just like everybody else in Uzbek or Karakalpak or even Kazakh, Communist Party in 1930s was uh, tried and shot during the purges in the late 1930s. So of course, these children growing up in orphanages, knowing the stories of their parents, um, they are treating very, very carefully around the notions of nationalism. They don't want to be accused in being, you know, bourgeois nationalists. So they have to present themselves in a the perfect Soviet sense of being Soviet and national. This is that hybrid notion of being Soviet and national at the time at the same time. So it does seem that Savitsky is not the one, is not the mastermind behind all these things. He does have some intuition and sense of what works to acquire and you know how to deal with these things. But it seems like there are other people who are alongside him helping him to do this, to pull his tricks. So in that sense, he's not this purely cynical uh, character, I would argue. Um, so um, in terms of the museum and how colonial or not Soviet it was, um, it's difficult to say. I would think it was not a perfect colonial museum for Savitsky uh, as an outsider, as not local indigenous uh, population member, because for one, he did um, kind of, you know, uh, local artists, Karakalpak artists, which were usually local Central Asian artists throughout the Soviet era, especially before and right after the war, they were considered not fit uh, to be painters. It was, you know, very well known um, idea between the Russian painters who would 
end up in Central Asia that locals are not good fit for modernist paintings because they can just only do the traditional art, like, you know, sculpture, some, you know, small sculptures or like, you know, ornament and stuff like that. Because of course, historically Central Asian region is a Muslim one and painting people is not really part of that tradition. So for, you know, for whatever civilizational narratives that were present among the artists that came to the region during the Soviet times, they would think that locals are not a good fit. And Savitsky was trying, it seems, to overturn that, you know, persistent narrative. He created that, you know, small school um, at the premises of the museum. He was trying to teach local Karakalpak artists, um, you know, to paint in like European kind of, um, I don't know. So in that sense, I think it's not Orientalist and not uh, colonial because the, the colonial notions are always about maintaining the difference, right, between colonized and colonized. So you cannot blur that uh, line between them. And Savitsky was like, no, Karakalpaks are perfectly fit to be great painters. They have a great sense of like color and whatnot. So they can do that. We just have to teach them and give them examples. So I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I think Savitsky was more wholeheartedly Soviet in that regard. Um, I'm not sure if we're running out of time. Or we? We do have one question in the Q&A that I want to make sure we get to. Um, this is from Natalia Plagman, um, who asks um, if you could say a few words about the tension caused perhaps by the fact that Sav Savitsky himself is an outsider in relation to the Karl Kalpax. Um, does it provide him with the benefit of distant perspective? Uh, might it also manifest yet another dimension of a colonialist approach to the other? Yeah, that actually adds, um, kind of builds on your question, right? It seems or connects to it somehow. So um, that's interesting. I would uh, maybe talk for a minute about how Savitsky was perceived by local Karakalpax because there were a lot of uh, memoirs and stories left behind about how Savitsky was perceived by these people because he was basically going door to door to collect these 19th century um, local Karakalpak art because what it was, it was usually some handmade, um, I don't know, uh, bridesmaid dresses, some kind of like, you know, local cultural traditions, uh, traditional attire uh, that was already considered deemed uh, kind of old school and now modern by 20th century Karakalpaks. They were just throwing it away. Some, you know, uh, carpets and rugs, hand woven, which Savitsky realized were a real treasure. And locals were just basically, you know, throwing it away. So he was just going door to door, talking to locals. And locals actually perceived Savitsky as just uh, like you guys are suggesting that he was an outsider, but they kind of thought that he was not a very smart person. That they thought he was very naive, that he wanted things that nobody else wanted. And so they actually kind of, it's interesting that locals were once patronizing Savitsky. They were trying to kind of, you know, help him out because they thought that you know, he doesn't really know what he's doing. So again, inverting that narrative of colonizers and colonized, where usually the colonizers are, you know, providing that perspective of like, we know better, we have more education. Locals thought that they have to basically help Savitsky out because, um, you know, he was that naive uh, little person who needed things that nobody else would have any use for. So um, again, I'm not sure that fits. Um, it just seems like this whole story of locals helping outsider out, creating that museum that benefits various groups. It does not fit the, you know, that um, narrative of um, to just, you know, dichotomies as colonized and colonized, modern or traditional. It's just a little too, uh, I would not want to say hybrid again, but, it's just a little too complex on various levels. And maybe that's actually an example of that late Soviet periphery where things are not black and white, it's not binary. It seems like one of the components here also is that this isn't Tashkent either. It's a, it, if, you, if you consider Tashkent the periphery in relation to Moscow, um, Karakal Pakistan is the periphery of the periphery. Um, and it kind of upsets all those um, divisions, maybe. Uh, yeah, it does. That, that's actually a great comment. It does upset those, uh, you know, um, things even more. And again, then you have to imagine that in this periphery, off the periphery, back of beyond, you have this museum, which even Tashkent does not have as a cultural center of Central Asia, allegedly, right? 
So. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question if anybody else has questions. Okay. Um, so I guess the my my I will add one last question then, which I hope you can uh, that we, we can we can build on in future conversations as well. Um, so you you frame this story um, in the, in you know especially in the introduction to your talk as a story about one museum. Um, this is obviously a very important museum, um, uh, a museum that lots of people are interested in. Um, but I think, you know, the, the conversation here, and I think, you know, your answers to the questions and, you know, the development in the rest of the essay, I think that they really suggest um, you're onto something more than just, uh, you know, reframing the historiography of the Savitsky Museum, right? That I think um, um, th it seems like this project is, it, it, you know, contributing to um, a, a, a better understanding of the, uh, you know, colonial versus modernization, you know, endless debate um, a, about the question of nations and nation building, um, about the tactical use of official discourses uh, in the late Soviet period. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for your project and I'm looking forward to hearing, um, to hearing more about everything that this, um, that this museum, everything else that this museum sheds lights on, light on, the bigger questions as well as um, this, you know, the specific um, museum, the history of the museum itself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Just one um, thing to add to what you just mentioned that I totally agree with you that it seems like this is the, the late Soviet post-World War II moment for Central Asia and all Soviet peripheries is the moment when this is already the generation that was um, kind of educated and raised um, in, in the Soviet context. And they speak this Soviet, um, Soviet language perfectly. So they are the ones, that's why it's so difficult to see them as on the either side of either co colonizers or colonized because these are the perfect former um, colonial subjects who are now speak the same language as their, you know, colonizers. So it's very difficult how, uh, difficult to see the differences or similarities. So it becomes this hybrid Soviet context where basically um, a person who, like Savitsky, who was born in Ukraine, then lived in Moscow, then lived in Samarkand and moved to Nukus, he can speak perfectly well to people in Moscow, in Tashkent, in Nukus, everywhere, even though there's a totally different cultural, social, um, economic um, context, right, in a sense. So this is maybe how this, if not Sovietsky Narod, but some notion of like Sovietness finally in 1960s and 70s started, starts forming, like, you know, naturally, without being just forced from above all the time. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks again to all of you. <laughs> Thank you to everybody for being Thank here. Thank you so much.